Brilliant. So we're just allowing the final people in from the waiting room, and I'm sure others will join us as the evening unfolds. We are live streaming as well on YouTube. So hello to our audience here on Zoom or in Zoom technically, and then also with us on YouTube and hopefully on Twitter as well. So I'll just start us off this evening. Um, my name is Katie Natanel, and I'm a senior lecturer in gender studies at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. And just a little bit about the series. This has been a creative, collaborative, and political engagement between the European Center for Palestine Studies, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and the Exeter Decolonizing Network. Um, and tonight we're very pleased to be welcoming Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, and I'm going to stop there and I'm going to actually hand over to our chairs for the evening, Rame Ramile and Natalie Ohana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. I'll uh, start by introducing myself. My name is Rame Ramile and I'm a social and cultural psychologist. I'm also doing my PhD at the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies. Luckily, lucky to be working with Katie and Ivan. My project engages with collective trauma and explores an indigenous construct that help Palestinians cope with hardship, referred to as SMOOP. Uh, I'll be co-chairing the event with my colleague, uh, Natalie. So I'll pass, pass it to Natalie to introduce herself. Thank you, Ami, and hello and good evening, everyone. Um, I am Natalie Ohana. I am a lecturer at the law school in the University of Exeter. I am really excited to be here, and it is my really absolute honor uh, to be co-chairing this event together with my colleague um, Rami. Um, I would like to start by thanking our hosts and the people who made this event today possible. So the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, the European Center for Palestine Studies, and the Exeter Decolonizing Network. I want to thank the team behind the event, Asha Ali, Malcolm Richards, Katie Natanel, Andrea Wallace, Lara Frick, Sarah Wood, Sarah Roberts, Nadia Khalaf, Safi Darden, Joseph Sweetman, and Sajad Rizvi. I would also like to thank our audience uh, who joined us uh, in different platforms of, and from all over the globe uh, via Zoom and YouTube. Thank you to my colleague and the fantastic PhD student Rami Remele, who co-chairs the event with me. And a huge thank you to our speakers, to the incredible speakers this eve evening, Ilan Pape and Gabo Mate. The format for today is 45 minutes of a conversation, followed by 30 minutes of um, questions and answers. Um, Rami, over to you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to share with you some guidelines in order to make this conversation as smooth and your participation as, as smooth as possible. So for those with us on Zoom, please keep your microphone muted during the event. Uh, cameras may be on or off, as you wish. Uh, comments and questions are invited through the chat functions on Zoom and YouTube and via the hashtag matepape2022. These will be collated and moderated by us. Please communicate with kindness and respect as you would in person. Uh, this continues to be a difficult time marked by anxiety and loss. How we speak matters. Uh, please note that the event will be recorded. So you are welcome to change your name if you wish to remain anonymous. Uh, and we will use screen names to identify the speakers uh, in the Q&A. I would like to start first by introducing uh, uh, Ilan. Uh, Ilan Pape is a professor of history and director of the European Center for Palestine Studies. Uh, he's an expatriate Israeli historian and socialist activist. His research contextualizes the history of Palestine into a larger global context of settler colonialism and has deeply informed movements for transformation. He is the author of the best-selling uh, book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, uh, A History of Modern Palestine, The Israel-Palestine Question, The Forgotten Palestinians, A History of the Palestinian in Israel and the Idea of Israel. Uh, his 2016 book, The Biggest Pr Prison on Earth, A History of the Occupied Territories, received the Palestinian Book Award. I've had the privilege of working with Ilan for the past few months uh, in my PhD, and I have witnessed how he has cultivated uh, a politically motivated community of activists and, acad and academics 
uh, both in Exeter and across the world. I pass it to Natalie again. Thank you, Ami. I would like to introduce now uh, Gab Dr. Gabo Mate. Gabo Mate is a retired physician who, after 20 years of family practice and palliative care experience, worked for over a decade in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by drug addiction and mental illness. The best-selling author of four books published in 27 languages, Gabor is an internationally renowned speaker, highly sought after for his, for his expertise on addiction, trauma, childhood development, and the relationship of stress and illness. His book on addiction received the Hubert Evans Prize for Literary Nonfiction. For his groundbreaking medical work and writing, he has been awarded the Order of Canada, his country's highest civilian distinction, and the Civic Merit Award from his hometown, Vancouver. His books include In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress, Scattered Minds, The Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder, and with Gordon Newfield, Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. Gabor's next book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture, is due to be published in autumn 2022. On a personal note, Gabo Mates has had a profound influence on my work, analyzing the intersection between legal systems and trauma. Different from mainstream thought in medicine, psychiatry, psychology, education, and law, Mate understands trauma in relationship to forms of, of social oppression. Through his work, it becomes apparent that keeping one's trauma or a group's trauma invisible is a forceful political act that serves power and sustains oppression. This enabled me to use the concept trauma as a critical and subversive lens in the analysis of legal proceedings. Ilan, I will pass it to you for the beginning of the conversation. Ilan, I think you need to unmute, sorry hard to teach uh, an old dog new tricks. I would rather sit with Gabor in, in a room than, <laughs> than online. So I, I do apologize if every now and then there's a bit of hiccups. This technology does not suit me. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, I want to thank everyone who made this event possible, particularly thank you, Gabor, for finding the time uh, uh, and the patience uh, uh, to be with us uh, uh, tonight or this morning, wherever we are. Um, when we start such a conversation in this particular moment in time, we can probably uh, not avoid mentioning the Ukraine to begin with, even if our conversation series focuses on decolonization and Palestine uh, and, and other issues. It is clear that we feel compassion towards the victims of this brutal war waged on that country and anger at those who have the ability to stop the war and do not. And yet the Western media and political coverage of that war exposed high hypocrisy or high levels of hypocrisy. Uh, in particular, if you are someone who is aware of the human made and nature made catastrophes in the Arab world, in Africa, in the inner cities of North America, the pueblos of South America, and in particular in Palestine. I would like to chat with you about this and other notions related to decolonization in Palestine by attempting to associate your world of treating and healing and caring uh, for the individual's mental and medical health with my world of recording the chronicles of groups of people nations and minorities who individually uh, and collectively are under daily uh, uh, oppression and whose only crime is their perceived identity and, and locations. So before asking more focused questions on such specific topics, whether the Ukraine or Palestine, I would like to preface this conversation with the following question. How far can we go in projecting or applying your inputs on trauma, fear, depression, and above all addiction, which are all interconnected to the treatment of the individual, to an analysis of collectives, 
be their nations, movements, minorities, or groups bound by a collective identity? Can we talk about a collective trauma? Can we talk about addictions to ideologies, to fanaticism, to warmongering, to self-victimization, to victimizations of others by using the same methodology in order to find out why traumas are invisible, how can we make them visible, and what impact do they have on our lives when they are denied? Uh, just unpacking it with a small uh, 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 example before we, uh, I, I, I ask you to respond, Gabor. Uh, uh, let's, let's unpack one example, ideology. Can ideology be defined as an addiction? Can a certain harmful ideology be sustained either because of denial of its harm or because it seems to be pursued as a passion, uh, but in fact it is both self-harmful and harmful to others. Intuitively, I feel as an historian that this could have been an extremely helpful dimension, which I haven't used, I'm sorry to say, or a new entry point to my unfortunate choice of chronicling inhumanity as a major topic, especially in Palestine, but not only there, while moving to tears when discovering rays of humanity in it. A personal inclination, but I'm also not sure, and that's in brackets, whether this is not, has not become an addiction in a way. Preparing for this talk, I remember that Edward Said fondly, I should say, called me a Nakba junkie. I still believe it's a possible, it's, it's pos it is possible to know or to want to know what happened in, the, in 1948 in the catastrophe, the Nakba, to, to do it because of a pursuit for justice and not because you are addicted to uh, inhumanities and, and massacres, but I'm much more ambiguous after reading you. In any case, can we relate to racism, fanaticism and their harmful dehumanization of others, which in my work are at the heart of the chronicles of inhumanity that I narrate, with the realm of your compassionate approach to people who are addicted in the broadest possible meaning uh, of the term. Hmm. Well, thank you, Ilan. First of all, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. You certainly are one of the people um, I have most admiration for in this world. Um, it's a multi-layered question that you're asking me, and I'm not sure that I am adequate to respond to it, but um, let me begin. First of all, just you touched upon the Ukraine. Um, it's quite um, both astonishing and dismaying to see what's going on right now. You and I both agree on the unjustifiability of the war, the cruelty of it, I imagine, you know, um, but it's the hypocrisy that strikes me the most. So a New York Times columnist three weeks ago, shortly after the war began, has an article with the headline, my generation thought that the age of barbarism is over. We've just woken up again. I want to write that guy. Have you ever heard about Iraq? Have you heard about Yemen? Have you heard about Guatemala? Have you heard about Gaza? Have you heard about uh, the occupied territories? You're just waking up to the reality that there's barbarism in the world. So what kind of selective mindset would ignore all that? In Vancouver here, there's a concert organization, a musical concert organization. There's a young Russian pianist that was going to play here. He's now being banned. And uh, now the tennis association is talking about banning the Russian players like Medvedev and Rublev from tournaments. Okay, I think that's great. Let's sanction the Russians. Let's also exclude any Canadian athletes because Canada sells weapons to the Saudis with which to murder Yemenis. Let's also sanction the Americans for any number of internationally known and um, compared with Ukraine, much larger killings and massacres and invasions. You know, let's just, you know, let's of course sanction the UK. The UK has no right to be in any sports tournaments mm -hmm. given its history and its current uh, engagements. I mean, what could go on and on and on? So the hypocrisy um, cries to the heavens. And uh, it's not a matter of justifying. I, I'm not even going to go into the history of the Ukraine and all that. That's just not relevant here. But, but just, just the hypocrisy. Now, the, the hypocrisy comes out of ideology. And an ideology, by its very nature, 
includes and it excludes. And it's got hidden blind spots, which will exclude it from allowing any material that would challenge it to, to penetrate. So my own particular history with, uh, well, <laughs> let me talk about my serial disillusionment, first of all. So I grew up in communist Hungary, a Jewish survivor, infant survivor of the genocide. And uh, to me, the Soviet army were my heroes. They saved my life. I also believed in a system. And then there was the 56 revolution against this brutal oppression, Stalinist oppression that I wasn't aware of as a child because my parents weren't going to tell me about it. So I get disillusioned. And then you come to the West, and now it's America, which is the shining city on the hill. And then four years later, they're massacring millions of Vietnamese on, pub, on, on television, supported by the press. So I get disillusioned there. And then I'm a Zionist. And, uh, and my disillusionment with that began, and I'm, and I'm talking about the value of disillusionment, for, by the way. What I'm talking about is good to be disillusioned. I would always ask people, would you rather be illusioned or disillusioned? Would you rather know the truth or would you rather hang on to fancy ideas? So as a, as a young Zionist leader, I was given the task one year of giving a talk on how to counter Arab propaganda on the campuses. So I thought, well, if I'm going to counter Arab propaganda on the campuses, maybe I should find out what Arab propaganda actually says. So that's when I started looking into the other side. When I say the other side, I didn't read Arab propaganda, by the way. I read Jewish sources about Zionism. That's long before Ilan and his fellow new historians came on the scene. But there was already enough evidence in 67 to lead, lead me to conclude that what happened here was the exclusion of one people to establish a land for another that what happened in 67 was a very deliberately concocted war, which Ilan has eloquently documented since then. So anyway, I then present my point of view, not yet believing in it, but just here's their propaganda. And here's what they're saying. And all my fellow Zionists were angry with me. How can you be saying these things? And I said, I'm just pretending to be an Arab speaking my side. And they were upset for me, for even, I, I fulfilled the assignment, but they were upset with me for doing too good a job of it. So one more disillusionment, you know? So an ideology is addictive in a certain sense, because let me define addiction for you. So an addiction um, is any um, manifested in any behavior that a person finds relief or pleasure in, and therefore craves and holds on to, despite negative consequences and uh, does not give it up despite those negative consequences. So I don't want to call ideology exactly an addiction, but it's got features in common. It does provide psychological comfort to people. You know, when you're a Zionist, you've got a reason to live, you have meaning, you have a collective, you have a history that makes sense to you. You get to be both a victim, but also a victor which is deeply satisfying. Both of those are de deeply satisfying. In other words, you don't have to deal with your vulnerability. And all addiction is about not dealing with vulnerability. Addiction is about, because you were so hurt, that vulnerability threatens you so much, you basically try to numb yourself to your vulnerability. And Zionism as an ideology, and any ideology really, is a big antidote to vulnerability. Because now we have an answer to everything and uh, now we're we can justify whatever we do we don't have to be vulnerable we don't have to look at the truth so the ideologies are very seductive and 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 they work like like the addict is in denial of the problem that he's creating for himself let alone for other people that the, a person who is cacted or addicted to an ideology will be in denial of the harm being done to themselves and particularly to others. So yes, I think it's useful to talk about um, uh, ideology as addictive. And of course, uh, just as addiction, in my view, is an answer to pain, addiction is people's attempt not to feel their pain. It's understandable. 
in in the same way, you know, um, when I think of my grandparents who were killed in Auschwitz, that's very painful. Now, if I can believe that there's redemption and there's a response and there's revenge, redemption, response, and revenge through a particular state and its activities, well, then I can then deal with or not feel so much the pain of what happened. So yeah, the ideologies and addictions have a lot in common. And, and what mostly they have in common is the rigid incapacity and unwillingness to look at the truth of it. Thank you. So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, disillusionment and denial and how we confront it in situation as we are facing both in Canada and in Israel in a way. Uh, towards past evils and, 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 and current evils. Uh, we both come from a European Jewish background, you and I, with different trajectories, different fields of professional uh, interest. And yet in, in many ways, our concern about uh, Palestine and the Palestinians is our main and first meeting point. So Palestine uh, uh, would be very much present, I hope in our conversation as much as we can in the limited span of time we have. Uh, but I noticed in an interview you gave to Aretz, very typical to Israeli journalists, they ask you at the very end of the interview about your take on Israel and Palestine, as if this was a passing issue, uh, not entirely related to the conversation on crime, addiction, and trauma. Uh, I would like to take a different approach, or rather have, as we already started, a general discussion on these issues and related to Palestine and other concerns preoccupying the network and good in, uh, people who made this event uh, possible. So in order to, to fuse what you did in Canada and what we are both watching with horror is unfolding in Palestine, let us talk about our two, maybe our two settler colonial societies, so to speak, two political projects uh, established in the past uh, with the help of what the late uh, Patrick Wolf called uh, the logic of the elimination of the native. Uh, these settler colonial society, the Canadian one and the Israeli one, still by and large deny their past, a denial that enables them to continue, so to speak, the project of the elimination of the native. But we both approach it, I think, with some caution you express every now and then your sense of gratitude for a Canada that received you and your family, which is probably akin to what I should have felt towards uh, Zionism in Palestine that gave refuge to my parents escaping from Nazi Germany in the 1930s. We both were, I think, tell me, uh, unless I'm wrong, we were unaware uh, of the settler colonial setting, genocide and ethnic cleansing that accompanied these two safe havens uh, yeah. for our families. And probably our life changed when we became aware of these atrocities. Uh, you dealt with it in a very positive, I, I think, approach when you told the Toronto Star for Canadians to be truly uh, uh, strong and free, uh, uh, we, must be, uh, uh, we must come to terms with our grim past. A quote which led me to assert that these are not just personal journeys we have taken, we were and are guided by indigenous victims of these colonization projects who helped us to decolonize our knowledge. And without the struggle for liberation, we have no way of changing the ideological system that have power both to continue narrating their version uh, as well as continuing the colonization that is meant to just justify, uh, that this narrative is meant to justify. So we can treat the Canadian and Israeli denial as a political situation, but it seems from what you're saying that it's also a mental situation. Can we also treat the denial in the way you would treat denial when you confront it, when you meet patients or clients who deny their trauma, depression, and addiction, or all of them together? And I just want to add my frustration when applying this process to Israel, as I do believe as, as an activist, that some measure of acknowledgement and even co-resistance has to come from the settler or colonialist community for the healing process, namely the decolonization to succeed. But to even begin this, you need at least to be able to elicit some compassion from the Israeli Jews to the Palestinian plight. And this hardly exists. Do you feel a similar problem 
prevent such a process in Canada. And again, as you are leading the way in showing compassion to, to addicts in a society that tends to review them as criminals rather than victims, maybe your interaction with the state anti-drug policy and the overall cultural and social denial and criminalization of these people by the society at large can also be can help us to deal with our societies, their lack of compassion that I think is, is uh, the, the main hurdle to start a conversation about the denial. And because as long as Israel would be a state of denial in the double meaning of a state of denial, I can see no way of ending uh, uh, the, the, the violence that Israel imposes on the Palestinians, wherever they are. Well, yeah, so Canada did receive our family with open arms. Um, and we appreciated it. And I didn't know what was happening here. The same year, in my new book, I talk about this. The same year that we arrived in Canada in um, 1957 as Hungarian refugees. And by the way, speaking of refugees, <laughs> um, Europe is now welcoming with open arms the Ukrainian refugees as they should. But in the New York Times this last weekend, there was a front page article in the New York Times magazine about how the same Europe had closed its eyes and its arms and its hearts to the Middle Eastern refugees that European policy had created. So there's a hypocrisy even in the generosity. So yes, we were received as refugees in Canada, anti-communist refugees, you know, which didn't, wasn't, wasn't entirely irrelevant. And, but in the same year that I arrived here in British Columbia in 57, there was a woman who was then four years old. I've met her since then, a native woman. Her name is Carlene. And uh, she was taken to the residential school. Now, the residential schools were places where run by the churches, um, where the government mandated that native children be abducted from their families they were not permitted to see their parents. The parents were threatened with jail if they even tried to see their kids. And in these residential schools, these kids were abused emotionally, sexually, physically, culturally, spiritually, and starved as well. Thousands of them died. This last summer, this to say June of 2021, they discovered a group of bodies of young children now, this wasn't news to the indigenous population. They'd been talking about these missing children for decades, but here was proof. And thousands of these bodies were discovered. Now, two weeks before these bodies were discovered, there was a poll in Canada, a public opinion poll, which found that 70% of Canadians said they knew nothing or little about the residential schools, which in a certain sense is astonishing. In another sense, it's an artifact of colonialism and denialism. Now in that same year that I arrived in Canada, there was a four-year-old indigenous woman, Carlene, who was taken to residential school. She made the mistake of speaking her own language, her tribal language. Mm -mm. The punishment that she had a pin stuck in her tongue. And so for a whole hour, this little girl couldn't put her tongue back in her mouth because she would cut her lips. And that's before the sexual abuse began. So she was an alcoholic by the time she was nine years old. Can you imagine? And of course, her grandchildren are now drug addicted. Now, two weeks after these bodies were discovered, a prominent Canadian pseudo journalist named Conrad Black, who was knighted by the Queen, Lord Black, Lord Black writes an article saying that, what is, what's the big deal about a few dead bodies? Now, it's illegal in Canada. It's illegal to deny the Holocaust, but it's perfectly legal to deny the cultural and, 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 and physical genocide of native people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's denial. And the denial comes as two bases to it. First of all, if you're the perpetrator 
and you want to continue to perpetrate, then you just have to deny that you're perpetrating. That's not where most people come from in their denial. Most people come from their denial um, in from sources, I think, that where, where there's a confluence of personal history and large-scale history, societal history. So denial happens when to admit the facts is just too painful. A lot of people are traumatized in this culture. A lot more people are traumatized than we realize. And for them to be, uh, to be aware of how they were hurt by people that love them or were meant to love them is too painful to admit. So they're in denial. So that what I'm saying is that in this culture, quite regardless of the history or perpetration of genocide, people are individually on a large scale psychologically programmed to be in denial about reality of the world. Now, when people are psychologically minded to deny, that will then support the large-scale historical denial. And furthermore, there's a kind of passivity that this society engenders in people. I mean, who really wants the earth to be destroyed? But what are most people doing about it? Nothing. That's a kind of ingrained, uh, Eric Fromm, the psychologist, talked about the social character. And the social character is inculcated to the family of origin, but it serves a social purpose of making people fit into the society as the society is structured. So apart from the personal denial that feeds the social denial, there's also this passivity so that, you know, you ask the average Israeli, or the average Canadian or the average British person put together three intelligent sentences about the history of Palestine. They couldn't do it. You can ask the average British person which participated, whose country participated in the invasion of Iraq with the death of millions, you know, half a million people at least, put together three intelligent sentences on the history of Iraq or of Afghanistan or right now, tell me three intelligent sentences about the history of the Ukraine in the last 10 years. Mm. They couldn't do it because there's this ingrained passivity that's built into the social character. And that then serves the interests of the social political structure that is designed to perpetrate because people are in denial and people are passive. So here's where the personal psychological feeds into the social and historical. Definitely, I can recognize it so uh, easily when uh, thinking about Israel. Uh, as, as you know, just recently, uh, an affair I was involved with uh, about uh, a horrific massacre that happened in 1948 and, and was denied for, for many years. And a naive, in a way, a naive Israeli filmmaker uh, was able to to expose the mass graves of this massacre, which really was the the most important solid evidence for what we have claimed for many many years that this 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 happened. And he told me now the whole discussion in Israel about uh, the atrocities committed in 1948 would change. And I said to him, it won't change okay. because even the people he, he did a documentary film. I said to him, even the people that you are interviewing who admit uh, of perpetrating uh, uh, the massacre, say, A, why do you want to talk about it? There's no need. And secondly, uh, uh, they lived for many years denying that, that, that massacre, and it reflects the society's uh, 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 denial of that uh, event. So, so definitely the, the kind of connection between the individual denial uh, of one's own path uh, and accountability on the one hand, and the overall, I would call it orchestrated denial by, by the state uh, go uh, hand in hand. But I think when you talk about the indigenous, uh, the First Nations in Canada and the indigenous, I also noticed that you're not only, uh, of course, uh, tell us the, the, the horrific 
uh, experiences that they had and so on. But you also feel, as I do when I talk to Palestinians, that we have a lot to learn from them, oh. uh, both uh, in your medical treatment, but also in your uh, uh, overall uh, uh, kind of comprehension of reality. And, and, and obviously in Canada in particular, we can see how decolonization in this respect is uh, uh, connected with indigenous rights, but also, and because of that, with ecology. So you, you, you had a dialogue with a group called the Indigenous Climate Action that works on the assumption that ecological disasters and disruptions are an ongoing, uh, shall I call it, traumatic event or, or even a structure that spans generation. And, and there is a good, quote, a, a, a fantastic quote from what I think she's the founder of ICA, who says that uh, uh, this whole issue of ecology in Canada, but not only in Canada, is interwoven, she says, into colonization in the form of modern extraction practices, by which I think she means, of course, uh, the way we extract uh, minerals uh, and so on. So namely colonization is based on denying the intricate, maybe even the organic relations between identity and our natural surroundings. And you told this group, and I quote, I find it, yeah, I find it, it's here. If someone learned how to drop our arrogance, I mean the arrogance of Western slash Northern culture and open ourselves to learning, what could we learn from you, you meaning this particular group and bring us back to ourselves and stop this madness. Is this unlearning and learning help us to decolonize our ecological world? So where are we in this dialogue in Canada in, in not only telling you know, the chronicles of what has been done, but respecting this group of people as a group that can teach us how to deal with ecology, nature, and reality. Well, um, let me leap up for a moment. I'll be right back. Okay. Don't leave. Okay. Uh, so hand back, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. So this is a cedar hat given to me by one of the First Nations groups that I've spoken with in Canada. Uh, and, and, I, and I do that a lot. And uh, there's a lot to be learned. So um, in fact, I just spoke with a group yesterday here. And uh, let, me, let me tell you a story. So in, in my field, medicine. Um, Western medicine, terrific achievements, obviously. But it's also hopelessly narrow in its perspective. It, 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 it separates entities that in real life are inseparable. So it separates the mind from the body. So when you go to see the average physician with a chronic medical problem, they're never, they're never gonna ask you about your childhood, your traumas, your personal relationships, how you feel about yourself as a human being, your stresses on the job. And yet these have everything to do with why most people get sick chronically. So they separate the mind from the body. They separate the individual from the environment. So, so that disease is seen as a biological event in an organ, that's it. Now, it, that's not what works in reality. Give me, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the more experience of racism a black American woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma. Indigenous women in Canada, who never used to have any rheumatoid arthritis, any autoimmune disease prior to colonization, now have six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis of any other person in Canada, indigenous women do. Now, I'm not gonna go into the reasons to that for that, but it, it all has to do with um, suppression, self-repression, um, which is imposed by um, um, a colonialist um, male dominated society, the, you know, the patriarchy. So now, but Western medicine doesn't make those connections, despite all kinds of evidence. So it's, it's not that we don't have the science, we have the science, we just choose not to look at the science, talk about an ideological blinder. Now, by contrast, I was talking to a colleague of mine who's a Lakota Sioux, part Lakota Sioux urgent, um, American physician and psychiatrist. 
And he said that in the Lakota tradition, when somebody gets sick, the whole community gathers and says, thank you, your illness is manifesting the pathology of the whole community. And so your healing is our healing. Now, let me tell you, from the perspective of hard science, that's much more scientifically accurate than the split Western view. And that's not the only area in which we could learn a lot. We could learn a lot. <clears throat> we could learn a lot about resilience. I mean, dire and, 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 and horrific as the situation in some of Canadian, in Canada's First Nations communities is with the impacts of multi-generational abuse and dire and horrific as the situation often is in the in Palestine. I'm sure, Ilan, that you have been as impressed as I have been here in Canada with the sheer resilience of these people, with the capacity to survive, endure, and continue to create, and continue to have positive responses, even in the face of unbearable oppression. You know, I know a woman in uh, Jericho who works with well, her, her neck was broken by the Israeli army. An Israeli surgeon operated on her and helped to save her life. But what she does is she does Sufi dancing, you know, the whirling, the Sufi dervish whirling with Palestinian kids who spent months in these jails not being allowed to see their parents. Well, how the heck do you have that kind of positive energy? after your neck is broken, I mean, you're so oppressed. I mean, and she's one of the most lively people that I know. And it's the same with a lot of the indigenous people I meet here in Canada. So we can learn a lot from resilience, about resilience. We can learn about the unity of all beings. And, and when, when, when an indigenous person think of a river, the river is part of them. They're part of the river. That's a totally different way of relating it. I'm not looking at some object out there. They're actually looking at some entity that's as a part of them. It's hard to even put it into words, but it, it's a point of view that certainly if we learned from, it could save us. So yes, we have so much to learn. And uh, again, if we didn't have these blind spots, um, we would uh, open ourselves to wisdom that could really help save the planet. Just, um, do you, if, if, if I take it a bit further and thinking about uh, the way, especially in Western societies, we dealt, we still are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis and, and taking into account uh, you, you, the way you, you, warn, you warn us against, uh, about the risk of, uh, uh, of basing uh, 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 medicine on biology and chemistry alone and against the conventional rejection of a more holistic approach to illness and the treatment, or as, you, as, as you've just put it, that the norm is treating disease as an independent uh, uh, entity, an approach that decontextualizes the, the illnesses from the social, cultural, maybe even political environments. Do you, do you think this is something also that was at the basis of the way the Western societies and governments dealt with the COVID-19 or still are dealing with the COVID-19 or even the World Health Organization. And if it is something that is based on that particular approach that you are challenging, can there be another approach to deal with this uh, pandemic that as in the case of Ukraine also has these so much hypocrisy and cynicism and manipulation around it, as well as, of course, a, a genuine objective a reality of, uh, of a, a pandemic. Well, it'll, I think it'll take some time for us to really absorb the lessons of the COVID experience, but some things are, are apparent already. So um, who gets COVID? Who's, who's more prone to get COVID? In Britain, for one thing, it was people black, uh, Asian, people of color. They were more likely to get COVID or to die of it than uh, Caucasians. Well, that's not a isolated biological fact. 
That's a social fact of who's oppressed and who is poor and who's stressed. Boris Johnson, the formerly somewhat corpulent <laughs> prime minister of yours, um, was hospitalized, as you know, he spent time in an ICU. And he came out, he became a weight loss evangelist. He says, you know, because obesity is a risk factor for COVID. But what causes obesity? There's been an epidemic of obesity in the Western world, in fact, throughout the world, shockingly so, in the last few decades, with the spread of neoliberalism. So the obesity epidemic is not separate from the oppression and stress that people experience when economic and social conditions become more challenging. Mm -hmm. But he would never, he never, he would never talk about that in his anti-obesity campaign. Furthermore, if we understood each other, not each other, if we understood the world from a genuinely global sense, then, and, and knowing that viruses know no geographical or political boundaries, when it came to rolling out the vaccine, what we would have done, and I've heard, I didn't think of this myself, I've heard this pointed out though by people who mm -hmm. just opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have given vaccine to all the healthy people in all the rich countries. We would have uh, inoculated all the vulnerable people all over the world. That would have been a far more effective public health measure. But of course, it's we have the money, we have the power, not to mention the fact that governments gave all kinds of money to the private companies to develop the vaccine, but they share none of the profits of it. So some of these companies are making $1,000 a second with the product that was developed with government money. So that not COVID, not anything can be separated from the global colonial situation. If we didn't have a colonial mentality, if we saw somebody in South Africa or India or Papua New Guinea or Latin America, as important as we are, and as valid members of the community that we're a part of, then we would not make decisions based on privilege. We would make decisions based on inclusion. And that certainly hasn't happened in this COVID situation crisis. Not, 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 not to mention the outrageous amounts of money that the pharmaceutical companies want to charge these poorer countries. Yeah. Why don't they just make the pattern available? You know, the, uh, to everybody. I mean, are we, are we humanitarians or are we profiteers? Well, yeah, we're profiteers, which is itself the essence of colonialism. And not to mention in Israel specifically, they inoculated all the Israelis, but Palestinians, that's not our responsibility. Let them do it themselves. Yes, and, and I think one, one of the problems is because, because there is a, uh, an intricate um, explanation here, uh, above every other problem we have in, in challenging the narrative that is given to people to justify these unjust uh, policies, is that we don't always have uh, the time span uh, and, uh, and we don't have the ability to elicit the patience of people to, to, hear, to hear and listen to a more intricate uh, explanation. And, and you cannot do these things by sound bites. You really need uh, a space for this. But, but this probably is good for another uh, conversation. And I'm aware of our uh, time that is running out. And I wanted to, to just maybe as a final question, if, if not, I, I may be able to squeeze another one. But one of the, the things that really are impressive in your own biography is, uh, to not put it in any fine words, is your willingness to, to how shall I call it, risk lawlessness, <laughs> and maybe even prison when you refuse to adhere to policies or instructions not to regulate the administration of drugs to addicts so that they will not resort to a lethal overdose in case of an abrupt withdrawal or detoxification. 
process. And when you were told not to use a, a certain traditional medicine and an indigenous one in your clinic, uh, most of our uh, students who are part of this network are also activists and, and they keep asking themselves, how far can they take their action and, act and activism vis-a-vis uh, -vis the law of the land, if you want, the regulation? Or, or is, there, is there a kind of a sense of when you think it's time to break the law in a seemingly democratic society and how far we can go with this? Because you must have consciously known uh, that you are uh, disobeying, if you want, a, a policy, a regulation, or maybe even, even a law in some of the things that you have done uh, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, so is this something that you you feel is part of, of social activism and, uh, uh, and our role in, in, in our struggle against all the things we were talking about, denial, uh, oppression, and, and, and learning from the resilience of those who are at the receiving end of these uh, colonialist and racist uh, practices? It would be... Um an overvalorization of my own history to say that I've ever really faced any serious threat to my, my, my liberty. Uh, I was never in that kind of situation. Uh, I don't know what I would have done if I had been. I'd like to think I would have acted on principle, but who really knows? You know, you don't know until you're up against it. That's right. um, I think um, what I faced personally is like, I mean, the, when I, when in 1967, I wrote an article that Israel actually started this war um, to take over the territories. Um, I was kicked out of my father's house, you know. Now, to give him credit, towards later in his life, he came around and he started to see reality, you know. But so what you face, first of all, is you have to have a decision to make. Do you want to speak your truth? Or do you want to maintain your emotional relationships if the truth threatens those relationships so i think that's an important question for all of us and i i can't tell anybody else what to do but personally i've never been able to shut up about things that i felt were important to speak about including israel palestine and that's cost me some relationships and i say well that's that's the price to pay i'm in no position to advise anybody about breaking the law or not. There are many inspiring examples uh, here in Canada right now. Young people are protesting against the further takeover and destruction of native resources, forests, and so on. They're being taken, treated brutally by the police, by the way, brutally. And the press doesn't even report it. It's not news. Police brutality is not news in this country. Um, the police is valorized and heroized. Um, but I, I haven't done that myself. <laughs> a friend of mine who's 76 year old and is about, stands up to, to my eyebrows and she's a grandmother and she was arrested for <laughs> threatening the peace because she stood on a bridge blocking traffic as a protest against the destruction of native lands. So I can't advise any, anybody else because I don't know what I would do if I was confronted with that kind of a, a choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think the question we have to keep asking ourselves is uh, what is the truth worth to us and uh, what are we willing to give up um, in order to serve the truth as we understand it? And uh, that's a highly individual question. And some people throughout history, of course, have have given and are continue to give some extraordinarily brave answers to that, that question, but I've not been in that situation myself. Okay, great. So we started with the individual and we finished with the individual. I can see there are not only questions, I think there are whole books that are addressed to you. <laughs> so we might as well uh, start uh, getting the audience into our conversation and see what interests them and not only only us. And thank you, Gabor. I really learned so much from it. And uh, thank you so much for your patience and uh, attention. Oh, no, it's, it's my great pleasure. Thank you, Lan. Thank you. Okay. 
So I'm passing it to the moderators. Thank you very, very much both. We will start now the question and answer session. I will start with um, my own question uh, to Gabo. Um, in your understanding of trauma, you connect trauma to healing, agency and action. However, the dominant Western understanding of trauma medicalizes it, associates the victim identity to it, and makes it the center around which disciplines and expertise are built and developed. These lead to the weakening of agency of the people who have the most important knowledge that could lead to change and eventually to the reinforcement of colonization and oppression. What can we do to intervene in this discourse and dismantle those layers that limit the force embedded in trauma? Well, so first of all, Western medicine, specifically Western psychology, more broadly speaking, and Western culture, even more broadly speaking, if it understands trauma at all, which mostly it doesn't, has got a very narrow view of it. Um, now, that narrow view, of course, can't be separated from the needs of the society. So basically, any, any, any ideology will, any, any, any society will, will adopt a set of assumptions that reflect the interests of the dominant groups. Now, nobody with their, their eyes open can deny that what we call democracy is nothing democratic about it, that it's actually controlled very tightly and uh, very efficiently, really, by a propaganda system that's a whole lot more eff efficient than the crude propaganda system in communist Eastern Europe that I grew up with. The propaganda system is far more subtle and effective. Um, but at the top, there's a group whose interest the system serves. Now, the main institutions of that society, whether in education, law, or medicine, will reflect the ideological needs of that, of that structure. So it's not just an intellectual debate. When, when you talk about the blindness, the blind spots of Western medicine, it's not just a question of facts versus other facts or knowledge versus other knowledge. It's also a reflection of an ideology of a top-down ideology. So the ideology of trauma is pure victimhood, where the victim has no agency fits in with a society of social control or, or with a culture of social control. So when you say, how do we dismantle it? You're never gonna do it on an intellectual level. If it was only a question of intellectual uh, argumentation, uh, the debate would have been over decades ago because the facts about trauma are undeniable. The reason why a deeper awareness of trauma doesn't penetrate the medical schools is not just because the facts are not there, but because those institutions themselves are traumatizing institutions and many of the practitioners who come out of them are traumatized people. And furthermore, the pharmaceutical companies who um, who profit off the system and whose funding fuels a lot of the research have no interest in healing trauma. They have an interest in mitigating the effects of trauma through either psychiatric medications or medicating chronic illnesses that have a traumatic basis. So they're not interested in healing, they're interested in symptom control. Now healing, as you imply, involves agency on the part of the individual. But you can see an activism even, you know? Now heaven forbid that people should uh, become actually active agents in their own lives. I mean, never mind in medicine, what would that do to the whole social structure? So that you're actually talking about challenging not just the narrow ideological perspectives, but the whole social structure that fuels that narrowness. So that's a much larger question. And, then, and my answer is, I have no idea how to do it. All, all I do 
Uh, I mean, it's like asking Ilan, how do you do undo colonialism in Israel Palestine? He'll probably tell you, if he knew how to do it, he would have done it by now. You know, all he, all he keeps doing is he, he keeps speaking the truth and trusting that with some people, the truth will have some traction and that eventually it'll prevail. That's all I can do with my view of trauma. So I have no idea how to mantle any, dismantle anything. All I know is how to keep seeing the truth, saying the truth as I see it. And that's what I'm advising you to do as well, without any hope of immediate results, by the way. Because you might be gray, uh, like Ilan and I, before you, <laughs> before you see too much result. But you know what, at the same time, it's having an impact. You know, and, and, and more and more people are waking up. So that's the positive side. Thank you very much. Rami, would you like to ask this second question? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, as someone who studies psychology, I always see a tendency to universalize whatever has been studied in Western societies and trauma as a construct, as, as a concept came from the US after the Vietnamese war. And as a word, when I try to translate it for Arabic, for example, it doesn't stand. We still have, uh, like the literal translation would be shock. So uh, in my work, I try to contextualize and uh, focus on the context. So I'm curious to see, do you think that there is a universal response to trauma that is common across all, all individuals? And uh, the second question, which you tapped on briefly, is when you talked about the indigenous communities in Canada and how they respond uh, to their trauma and they have resilience practices, what can we learn from those practices that can be adapted by uh, the psychiatry discourse or in a healing practice without being co-opted? Those are my questions. Thank you. Well, as to the first one, um, what I can tell you is just last week, um, my already published books were bought for translation to Arabic. An Arabic publisher wants to bring them out. This is on addiction. This is on chronic health, chronic illness, mind-body unity. It's on attention deficit disorder. It's on child raising. And all four of them will now be published in Arabic. My new book, The Myth of Normal, has already been bought for Arabic translation. And uh, not to be too personal about it, but I have to take some heart from the fact that my books have not been published in 30 languages, in 30 countries, you know, 30 languages, actually. And what does that say? Uh, it says something about the universality of trauma and the nature of human experience. Now, that universality is refracted through certain cultures. There'll be different cultural manifestations, but the fundamental underlying humanity um, and a human experience it's universal and I get that response from all over the world. So they know that it's universal, which I, what else do we expect? We're the same, you know, I mean, you can, it's like asking if you take uh, a German shepherd and treat it badly, how is that different from treating a poodle badly? Well, it's not that different, even though the poodle and the German shepherd look very different, you know? So um, there's a universality to trauma underneath the cultural differences. As to what we can learn uh, from indigenous cultures, well, the biggest learning is a greeting that is used in Canada, I think in the US as well, by indigenous people. They say, all my relations. And all my relations means all my relations. That means not just all my relatives, it means all my ancestors, the earth, the rocks, the sun, the stars, everything, like we're all connected, they're saying, the greeting is we're all connected. But that little lesson alone, little, it's a huge lesson, that would transform healing if we saw all the connections. When, when, in a, when you go to a sweat lodge, a sweat lodge is a, a tent um, in which there's a pit and there's, they, they, they drag in hot rocks and you sit there, you know, and, and in a close circle and they bring in, there's a pit and they bring in these fiery hot rocks, red hot rocks, and they pour water over them and then steam. 
and you really sweat. It's called the sweat lodge. It's a transformative healing experience. But when they drag in the, the rocks, they say, here come the grandmothers and the grandfathers. So the rocks are the grandmothers and the grandfathers. Aren't they? Don't we come from the earth? You know? But what if we understood that? That's the teaching. All my relations. Thank you so much. Natalie, would you like to take the next question from yes. Ozan? Yeah, thanks, Ami. So the next question is for both Ilan and Gabo. Um, it is from Entale Eastmond, um, who's asking. So I'm a, psych I'm, I'm a psychotherapist from London and have found that there is a distinct lack of compassion from white people from the UK in and outside of the therapy room towards the experiences of racialized people, save often for European Jews. If we can understand this from a perspective of trauma and denial, how do you think this can be changed on both an individual and societal level? Well, I've been speaking for a while, so how about letting you learn? <laughs> I'll let you rest for a second. Um, first of all, I, I, I'm sure that this is a very uh, uh, accurate uh, description uh, not only uh, in the therapy room, but also in the way people are represented in the media, in the academia, in the public discourse, in the public uh, domain. Uh, and this is why I think, and this is what we are doing in the decolonization network in Exeter, we definitely do not exempt Britain uh, from discussion of colonizers, uh, colonizers society or societies of colonizers. Namely, we don't think that the uh, political decolonization of the empire back in the mid 1950s or 1960s meant that Britain was decolonized as a society. The treatment uh, of, of uh, minorities or former subject of the empire uh, all uh, uh, indicate that this, this is a racialized uh, society uh, that uh, is still practicing old colonialist uh, attitudes uh, when dealing with, uh, let's call it non-white people, although this is not the best way of, 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 of defining it. A and I think that uh, uh, there is a denial in Britain uh, about this kind of uh, racism that is still institutional, uh, is uh, uh, sometimes visible, sometimes less visible. Uh, we, we see it in every uh, walk of life. And, and uh, sometimes the way that we are dealing with Britain as a post-colonial uh, society uh, it, it absolves us as, as people who live in Britain from realizing uh, how much of the uh, racial and colonialist attitudes are still uh, with us. Uh, it's, it's like I remember, I think Gabor even said it to me that if he would be invited in, in Palestine to talk about post-trauma, he would say, wait a minute, it's, <laughs> there's no post-trauma as yet. There is uh, so many people still experiencing the trauma itself. Or, or, or when uh, some scholars talk about uh, use post-colonialism to describe uh, certain areas, including Palestine and Britain, and you say, wait a minute, we're not yet in a post-colonial reality in many, so many parts of, of, of our society. So uh, as Gabor said, I think our role, first of all, is to expose it, to show it, because it is covered with certain narratives, even with academic scaffolding, and definitely media coverage. So we need to, to expose it, to show it, and, and then uh, go back to questions of resilience and challenge of how to change it, of course, not as individuals, but as social movements uh, who believe that they have both the agency and the power, at least to, to begin changing this uh, uh, racial uh, reality that I, I'm sure you are experiencing both in your uh, therapy uh, uh, treatment and we experience it in the academia and the media and other walks of life. There is an American black psychologist named uh, Dr. Kenneth Hardy who talks about what he calls the assaulted sense of self. And this is where the racialized person takes on the view of the racializer. 
Now, I've had an interesting experience so that, you know, people start to see themselves as disempowered and inferior. Um, I've, I've had an interesting experience with that because in Hungary, I was, I was a Jew. And in Eastern Europe, if you're a Jew, you know that you're a Jew. Um, there's kind of a visceral, historical otherness that, that, that is bestowed upon Jews in Eastern Europe. It certainly was when I was growing up. I was bullied for being a Jew. I remember a friend of mine coming to my defense once saying, leave him alone. It's not his fault that he's Jewish, you know? <laughs> it's a fault, but it's not his fault. He can't help it. Then I come to Canada, and all of a sudden, I'm a white man. Because for all the complaining about antisism in Canada, it's trivial compared to what it is in Eastern Europe. And certainly trivial when it comes to the anti-indigenous prejudice in this country. So really I become part of the, the dominant um, group. And what's interesting for me is how quickly when one becomes, when one joins the privileged stratus, strata, stratum, how quickly one forgets what it's like to be on the other side. So that I, I start taking on the attitudes to some degree of the dominant, uh, patriarchal figure that this society allows me to be. I just wanted to share that. I have nothing to add to Ilan's words. I, I think it is a case of um, personal refusal to accept that assaulted sense of self, to, to accept that othered view of yourself and uh, and to stand up for yourself whenever you need to. And then on a larger level, it's a question of social activism and truth telling and organizing. And it's gonna be a long struggle yet because uh, it's not a post-colonial society, as Ivan says. You know, the, the forms of colonialism have changed, but the essence of it has not. Thank you so much. We have uh, another question uh, from Asha Ali. Uh, she asks, as we are viewing in Ukraine, as we have throughout history, uh, the UK has been rewriting history to uphold a, manu a manufactured noble tradition to hide its brutality. How do you think we can find fight against this rewriting? It's a question for both of you, uh, whoever would like to start first. Well, I, I think I, from, my view, from my point of view, you've already answered it. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't have anything else to add. It's a good question, but I think we've been talking about it really throughout. Yeah. Yeah, I just said, Asha, one thing that, you know, there are genealogies that are being taught and constructed. And this is the big question we are pointing to the academia. Uh, is the academia mission statement is to challenge these genealogies which are by themselves uh, are act of violence uh, and, and justify violence in the past and in the present or are we as academics uh, continue to, to rehash the same genealogies and narratives because we care about our careers and the relationship we have with the powers that be and I think as Gabo said, it's, it's an individual decision how far you're going to challenge it, uh, how far, what price are you willing to pay for challenging it? And if you are in the comfort zone, how much of it, how much of the comfort are you willing to give up in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, to change, to ch challenge uh, this particular, both rewriting of history and the accentuation or perpetuation of a certain narrative that definitely is not based on facts or an objective reality, but is serving a certain uh, status quo uh, that uh, uh, one wants to, uh, should challenge because it is an unjust one. And, and, and in our case, that we're talking about a, race, a racist one and a colonialist one. Thank you both. Both. The next question is from... Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry I just want to add something here. It, it's to what Ilan said, and, and, and as Noam Chomsky, who Ilan and I are both, I'm sure, um, admire, 
Uh, he said once that the responsibility of intellectuals is to speak the truth and to expose lies. And he said, this at least may seem enough of a truism to pass over without a comment. Not so, however, for the modern intellectual, it is not at all that obvious. And, and so that, you know, intellectuals you think would expose lies and tell the truth, but really for many of them, it's the other way around. And they don't even know it because they were ideologically blind. It's not that it's even deliberate in many cases, it's just ideology driven. They're addicted to it. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you. So the next question, I think it's mainly for Gabor and it's related to the word uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. It is from Joanna Daggett who's asking. So she's saying, as a youth worker in Minneapolis, I have experienced the word resilience as, contri as contributing to passivity among white folks who leverage that framework. My young people are seen as admirably, admirably resilience, resilient in the face of state-sanctioned racial violence and decades of historical violence and trauma, but it seems to perpetuate a state of suspended awe among white folks like myself instead of creating an activated critique that my young folks have been forced to survive and even thrive in a set of conditions that us white folks would never accept for ourselves. How do we reframe and redefine a resilience framework for activism for not accepting these sets of conditions for anyone? So it's a very subtle question. Um, Resilience, like any other word, depends on context, and not just context, but also intention. So who's using it for what purpose? So uh, I could, for example, um, beat you over the head and exploit you and tell myself, she'll be okay, she's very resilient, which will allow me to keep you beating you over the head and keep exploiting you. And I think that's what the questioner means, is that sometimes we say the young people are resilient, as an excuse for not doing anything about what's happening to them. So that's the misuse. And every word, a word like truth, a truth like God, a word like God, a word like um, love, they can all be co-opted and be used to exploit people or to blind them. So that's one use of the word resilience. This is an excuse to ignore um, racialized, economized, socialized injustices. On the other hand, it's a good word. You know, it, it describes reality. You know, it, it describes the capacity of human beings to bounce back from some very painful and near devastating experiences and, it, and, and resilience speaks to the capacity of the human psyche to heal uh, almost after no matter what kind of disaster and, 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 and trauma. So it's a good word. But then the question becomes not just, oh yeah, they're resilient, but how do we support that resilience? How do we prevent the events from happening that hurt people in the first place? And if they are hurt, what can we do socially or psychologically or medically or personally or policy-wise to support that resilience? In that second case, resilience is no longer an excuse, but a call to action. So it all depends on how we're using it and for, with what intention. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Um, the next question is from uh, Denise Monzani, the Rocha. I'm a graduate anthropology student from Brazil. Um, during my field work in East Jerusalem, even though it wasn't the object of my study, I couldn't escape observing serious mental health issues. For instance, a woman who was paranoid, she couldn't relax inside her own house because she felt she was being surveilled all the time. I kept wondering about the relationship between her individual health and her environment. My question to Gabor is, 
what knowledge or insights regarding healing in the mental health field could illuminate also social processes or bring about social healing? Well, on the obvious level, for a Palestinian, if that's who we're talking about here, to believe that she's under surveillance by hostile forces is not entirely paranoid. Um, it's just a fact. But I understand what you're saying. She's talking about it in an unreasonable, overwrought way. In which case, it's an outcome of childhood trauma. So at some time in her life, she was small and helpless, and she was watched and controlled by people that did her harm. That traumatic experience then translates into itself into a belief about the world right now. Even if there's some accuracy to that belief, in which in the political sense, of course, there is, that belief in her case leads her to isolate herself and to feel fear all the time in a way that most Palestinians, despite the occupation, do not feel. So in that case, it's not just an outcome of political reality, but it's an outcome of a childhood trauma projected onto a larger social level. So she needs somebody who can actually help her deal with her trauma. So that her understanding of who's surveying her becomes a realistic one, rather than a projection of uh, inner terror caused by childhood hurt. Thank you. Um, I think we might have a another time for one question, but actually I wanted to ask if Ilan, maybe you have more thoughts on the question of resilience that was asked before. Uh, yes, and, and I'm glad that Rami is one of our uh, uh, co-hosts because Rami is writing a PhD on the Arabic term for resilience, sumud, which became a kind of a concept. And one of the things he shows in what I'm sure will become a very successful uh, doctorate is that sumud, uh, resilience, uh, uh, even within the Palestinian context, has more than one meaning. There's a different way resilience is understood in a refugee camp in Lebanon and how resilience is understood by a Palestinian citizen of the state of Israel or how resilience is understood by someone under siege uh, uh, in Gaza. And I think that um, at least from a sociological point of view, uh, I'm not sure from psychological point of view, but from a sociological point of view, uh, we are beginning, which I think is very good, we're beginning to dim the difference between resistance and resilience. We are not uh, uh, regarding resilience as something totally different from resistance. Your very resilience in the face of what you know are the objectives of the oppressor become a resistance. Namely, if the oppressor, in this case Israel, wants to dislocate you, to dispossess you, it is both resilience and resistance to stay foot, to be able to stay foot. It doesn't, so you are not resisting by, you know, raising arms or you are actively confronting the military power of the oppressor. You are dealing with resilience through that kind of daily existence. But even more so, which is really encouraging, and I hope we can finish on an, encourage, on an optimistic note this conversation. I find it inspiring that the Palestinian society, at least in historical Palestine, which is half, I think more than 50% are under 18 of that society. The younger Palestinian society see resilience also by insisting on having normal life, of having pleasure, of having joy, of not uh, uh, excusing everything on the occupation and the oppression, and by enabling to uh, uh, have a certain sense of normality in the face of an adversity and uh, 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 oppression that wants to deny them the normality. So I think it's, it's a huge project that would give new meanings to anti-colonialist resistance in Palestine 
uh, in the 21st century. We, we cannot rely anymore just about this romantic and important phase of the kind of anti-colonialist struggles we saw in the 1970s and 1980s, not only in Palestine, but everywhere. So, uh, so I think this is a, a huge uh, a project for, for having a very nuanced understanding of both resistance and resilience as part of the challenge to, unfortunately, I say it as an Israeli uh, Jew for a project that is still intent on destroying Palestine and the Palestinians. Thank you so much both. Um, I can see the time, so we won't ask the last question that um, we thought we might be able to ask, but I just want to say again, thank you so much for this incredibly important conversation. I know that I will definitely listen to the recording um, again. Um, I don't know, Lami, if you want to add something. I have nothing to add. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation and I learned uh, a lot. Thank you for the audience, for the beautiful questions. Um, that's it. Back to you, Nathan. Thank, thank you. you all. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Gabor. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Have a very Bye. good evening. Have a good day, wherever you are, people. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> or good night. Good. Thank you. Shukran Badam. Salam. Well, salam. Oh, ah. thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. For the office. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.